Hey, it's Marie Forleo, and you are watching Marie TV, the place to be to create a business and life you love. And today you are in for such a treat because I have on an author who wrote a book I've mentioned many times before. If you're interested in living a regret-free life, this is a must-watch. Bronnie Ware is an Australian author, an international speaker, and a songwriter. Her best-selling first book, The Top 5 Regrets of the Dying, touched hearts all over the world with translations in 27 languages. Bronnie's next book, Your Year for Change, is also in many translations. As well as being an author, Bronnie became a late-in-life mother and is a master of balance, conscious choice, saying no, and regret-free living. Bronnie has released two albums of original songs, and her third book is due to be released in the fall of 2016. Bronnie, thank you so much for being here on Marie TV. It's my pleasure, my absolute pleasure. So I know you've heard we've talked about your book several times on the show, so it's yes. such an honor to actually get to talk to you uh, about the whole process. So let's go back. You know, you had the opportunity to be with so many souls mm -hmm. through your work in palliative care. Yes. How quickly did you start to notice some common threads in the regrets? Uh, it was with, certainly within the first year. I, yeah. Yeah. So I worked on and off for eight years with dying people. So quite soon, yeah, quite soon into the journey, it was like, hang on, I've I've had this conversation before. You know, what's what's going on here? Yeah. And did you start writing things down or taking notes? Well, I always kept a journal anyway. And because my patients were often asleep or resting, uh, I had a lot, a lot of long hours. So I would just write in a journal, not having any idea that it was actually a future book coming together. It was more just um, about my life and how it was being influenced by the people I was looking after individually. So, yeah, I just kept writing and uh, and over time I found myself writing um, similar things, you know, as well as having those similar conversations. So, mm. so, and what was the journey like? So you did all of this incredible work and then take us to the point where you were inspired to write the blog post. Uh, I just finished working with dying people. I, I was uh, in a place where I really wanted to work where there was some hope. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, obviously once people are dying, they're, they're on their, their last chapter. So I'd managed to set up a songwriting program in a women's jail and uh, an editor for a magazine asked me to write an article about that, about how the songwriting course came about. And so I was teaching guitar and songwriting to female inmates at the time. And when I wrote that article, I thought, this is crazy. I love writing. You know, why aren't I writing more? I'll start a blog. And so I thought, well, what do I write about? And uh, I've got some very clear guidance, just write what you know. And I thought, okay, well, you know, I've, I've just finished working with dying people. I'll write about that time in my life. And so I just sat down with, with really no forethought at all and just thought, okay, well, how has it affected me the most? Why, you know, what have I learnt from the dying people the most? And straight away it was regrets and I thought, oh, of course, you know, it's been shaping my life for the last eight years. And, uh, yeah, so I ended up writing the article based on my old notes but also just on my memory of the conversations, posted the article and then uh, for about six months it sat and had a little bit of movement here and there where people asked to share it. And then uh, about six months later, it just went poof, and uh, I wasn't ready for that sort of um, uh, publicity six months earlier. So I was growing into that readiness for it. And uh, and then in time, that, that grew into a book and, uh, yeah, it's, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. So was it shared about three million times? In the first year, it was shared three million. In the first uh, two or three years, it was well over eight million views. Yes. Wow. Yes, yeah, it's it's hard to comprehend, really. And what were some of the notes and the letters that you were getting from people? Because it's, <sighs> I mean, the ideas and the concepts are very simple, but they hit you mm. right in the heart. And mm. for so many of us, and myself included, yes. it resonates as the truth. Yes, yeah, and I think that's what what happened is uh, it did resonate with so many, but uh, I think it, the simplicity of it was part of the appeal. And that it gives people permission to actually make those choices because it's not just someone else telling them it's it's dying people who have who were walking their talk. You know, they they had the regret at the end, and uh, and it was so 
so strong, the message. So I think it was mostly about just the simplicity of it and the permission to that it, that it gave the reader. Yeah. I'm curious, when you were actually hearing those regrets, is your a sensitive soul, you're a creative soul. Mm. Was it hard emotionally to be there and stand there and care for these people and at the same time have so much emotion that you're absorbing and listening mm. to? The the level of anguish and frustration that the dying people shared, um, expressed while they were sharing these regrets yes. was impossible not to be affected by. Yes. Um, but I also had to trust that that was their life path and at least they were learning these things at the end and some of them made me promise that I would share the wisdom on so that people would learn from their mistakes. So if anything, I just felt very honoured and and grateful to be that messenger and to also have the lesson given to me repeatedly so that I was actually incorporating it into my own life. Um, I, I couldn't teach it without walking it myself. So yeah. If anything, it was as, as heartbreaking as it often was for me. There were plenty of tears in the bathroom with the door closed during those years. But as difficult as that was, it was also far more an honour than anything to, to work in that, that role. Let's take a look at regret number one, which is so powerful. Mm. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. And I was so moved by Grace's story, specifically when she said, I mean it. Promise this dying woman that you will always be true to yourself, that you will be brave enough to live the way you want to, regardless of what other people mm. will say. Yeah, Grace still affects me on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, not always consciously, but but those months with her were, were certainly life-changing. And she had... Um, Stayed, she'd stayed in a marriage that was very unhappy and then as soon as her husband went into a nursing home, she was diagnosed with terminal illness and it was quite aggressive. So all of the dreams that she'd put on hold thinking maybe she'd get some freedom at some stage in her life were gone. There, there was nothing she could do about it and she was just a little, a really small lady but she was, she was fierce in her, her resolution and, and her determination to make me promise her and uh, yeah, she her regret was was so tangible. It was it was shocking. Yeah. And did you hear those similar kind of words from so many of the other people? over and over, over and, and over. over? Just do your own thing, love. Don't listen to what other people say. And wish I hadn't done this. Wish I hadn't done that. You know, it's it came from all different angles and men and women, um, just all different circumstances. But. The, Really, in a nutshell, the same message over and over and over. Mm. Yeah. And then regret number two, which is one that I think will resonate not only with our culture right now, but especially for entrepreneurs mm. and hardcore creatives. Yes. The regret, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Goodness gracious, every time <laughs> I pick up your book, I look at the blog post because I do look at it often because yes. I just feel like it's so important it to is. be reminded of these yes. ideas. And John's story is something that I don't think anyone watching the show couldn't relate to. Mm. Um, when he says, you know, you don't create a life where you're going to regret working too hard. He said, even though I didn't know I was going to regret it, deep in my heart, I knew I was working too hard. Mm. And I think there's so much wisdom in that. Yes, yes. On it's... one level, you don't think you're going to regret it. Mm. But there's a small voice inside, isn't there, when we're pushing too hard. Yes. And yeah. you can start to feel a soulful tug. I know I've experienced it mm. at times where I'm being really hard on myself, mm. trying to push, trying to make something happen, trying to meet a deadline. And I can feel Josh or I can, you know, Kuma will come up and, you know, animals do the yes. pawing you kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. And I can feel like a little part of my soul going, put the work down. So I'm just curious do you have anything well, else to add? Well, it, it is, you know, so many of us love our work. And yes. so it's it's not about not loving your work. And, and we do, we can get really caught up in it and just get, you know, get carried along. And uh, But there's no point of success if, if there's not balance with it because work isn't our whole life. And there is that little voice. So as much as we can get caught up in the busyness or the, the enjoyment and the striving of it, there is that little voice that, that will say, oh, hang on a sec, this is, and, and we can suppress it, but eventually we are, we're either going to have to honour that voice or, re, or have that regret. 
because there's so much more to life than our work and it's wonderful when the two become one, when you love your work so much, it's a huge part of your life. But there are plenty of other aspects in our lives that really deserve a lot of attention as well. And sometimes that's just being and turning off the phone and sitting at the beach or going for a walk. Um, just acknowledging that that it's okay to switch off from work and and give some, some solid time to other important aspects of our lives. Yeah. After you've been able to share this message now with millions and millions yes. of people, how has it informed your day-to-day -day choices? Like, did you make any big choices that you feel like because of these regrets, because you know them mm. and you've written them and you've shared them, that you found yourself at a crossroads where you could go one way or the other and this helped inform? There's, I, I can't count how many decisions I've made based on this and how many small and large crossroads. But if I'm faced with a decision that, that takes a lot of courage and uh, I find that courage now because I think, okay, I can go this way, it might be the easy way, or I can go this way, it feels harder, scarier or whatever, but this is actually where I want to go. And I think I'm either going to regret this or I'm not, you know, which, which way causes no regrets, the hard way, the challenging way, face the courage way, chung. And so you do become more and more courageous, you know, as, as you start using this as a tool for living, you know, using the wisdom from the dying as a tool for living. And so many decisions I make, even small decisions now, ultimately they're affected, they've been shaped by these regrets because if it's not going to feel good for me, I don't do it anymore. Mm. I, I just, I say no to way more than I say yes to. I I love yes, don't worry, I, you know, I yeah. love the word yes. But I've learnt to comfortably say no to so many things without guilt, without explanation, just because I know there's other things that will feel better for me and that no one's really at a loss if I say no. It doesn't matter. You know, we, we have to follow our own heart's calling and uh, that heart, heart's calling ends up benefiting everyone in the long run anyway. Do you feel like your intuition has gotten stronger? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. It's a guiding light. Because yeah. you probably hear it and listen to it more perhaps mm. than you did in the past. Well, that's right. Yeah, I, the, I, I often think about the, um, the Buddhist quote, the, the heart knows no questions, the mind knows no answers. And I think all of us have been shaped by, you know, we try and reason with logic in our mind, but the more we can actually follow our heart, which is our intuition and, you know, our our longing, then the louder it speaks. In fact, it starts singing after a while. It doesn't yes. even just speak. You know? I so. often feel like mine is so loud, like I cannot ignore exactly. it. Exactly. And yes. it's it's pretty visceral. Fantastic. Yes. Well, thank goodness you did. Yes. Thank goodness you did for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say too, and I, I just wanted to um, say how deeply honored I am that you're a B-schooler in the B-schooler community. Uh, clearly, you were very successful before, but mm -hmm. when I found that out, my heart cracked open and oh, I was fantastic. like, what a pillar of the world and we have the honor of being connected in that way as well. Yes, it was wonderful when I when I realized you were connected to my work in the same way and uh, B-School has brought some of the most gorgeous women into my life mm -hmm. and locally I, I just have, have the most wonderful tribe and we're all B-Schoolers, there's no no competition. We're all lovingly supporting each other's journey. If any of them have similar career paths, they collaborate rather than compete. Mm. And it's all thanks to you, Marie. So well, yeah, B-School is a positive place. I, that is so lovely to hear yes. because I think one of the things many of us are starving for in this day and age is a sense of community yes. and connection. And I yes. talk about that with my friends a lot yes. because no matter how wonderful technology is and it, it forms these beautiful connections. In yes. some ways, it can feel very isolating as well. Sure. And so I love, love, love to hear that. Mm -hmm. You know, you write, write something so beautiful. You say, the peace each of these dear people found before their passing is available now. Without having to wait until your final hours, you have the choice to change your life, to be courageous, to live a life true to your heart, one that will see you pass without regret. Bronnie, What's the closing thought you'd like to leave us with today? That it's okay to be happy and it's okay to live the life your heart calls you to. Thank you so much. You're oh. a beautiful, beautiful human being and thank you for putting this work into the world. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you so much, Marie.
Now, Bronnie and I would love to hear from you. What was the biggest insight that you're taking away from today's episode? As always, the richest discussions happen after the episode over at marieforleo.com. So go there and leave a comment now. Did you like this video? If so, subscribe to our channel and I would be so grateful if you shared this one with your family and friends. And if you want even more great resources to create a business and life that you love, plus some personal insights from me that I only get to share in email, come on over to marieforleo.com and sign up for email updates. Stay on your game and keep going for your dreams because the world needs that special gift that only you have. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch you next time on Marie TV. Uh, B-School is yeah. coming up. Want in? For more info uh, and free training, yeah. go to joinbschool.com. The heart knows no questions, the mind knows no answers. And I think all of us have been shaped by, you know, we try and reason with logic in our mind, but the more we can actually follow our heart, which is our intuition and, you know, our our longing, then the louder it speaks. In fact, it starts singing after a while. It doesn't yes. even just speak, you know.